Calder's Circus is one of the most iconic, beloved works in the Whitney's collection by a major artist who changed the way we think about sculpture. Calder's Circus is very important because it influenced his sculpture, his drawings, his paintings. It is the nucleus of his ideas. Calder's Circus is many things. The artist, the objects he made, his wife or someone else playing the Victrola. It was a total work of art. Alexander Calder made the components of the circus between 1926 and 1931, but he performed the circus for decades. The very minute we started to research and look at the circus, we realized that it is a performance piece. Calder Circus is an early example of performance art. Movement is the soul of the circus. Calder's Circus first came into the Whitney in 1970 when it was put on loan by the artist himself. Thirteen years later, the Whitney acquired it as part of its permanent collection. And when it arrived at the museum, it was packed in five suitcases that Calder had used to transport it around the world. The need to restore Calder Circus arose because the materials were fragile and we were concerned about their preservation over time. The initial response of the conservator is to treat the physical matter. In this case, we had to go beyond that. We realized we had to preserve audio, video, real circus history, art historical, and all kinds of other aspects. This was a multidisciplinary project that involved the work of a conservator, an art historian, and an archivist. Most artworks are made static and they remain static, but that's not true of the circus. It was alive and moving. So how do you put life and movement back into objects that over time have become static? That was really our challenge. <laughs> If you don't understand the full meaning of the work of art, there is no way you can know how to start preserving it. Calder was born in Lawton, Pennsylvania in 1898. His mother, his father, his grandfather were all artists. Since he was a child, could make something out of nothing scrap metal, uh, found fabric, whatever was at hand, he would make sculpture out of bread. In his 20s, Calder went to the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Braley Circus for two weeks with a press pass because he was doing illustrations for the National Police Gazette. He observed, he made notes, and what he saw affected his view of the circus forever. At the beginning of the 20th century, Circus was the single most important form of entertainment. It was a really big deal when the circus came to town. It arrived by train. The Ringling train had 100 cars. They would set up these enormous tents, and then there would be this grand parade with all the circus performers and all of the animals. Here she comes. Everybody loves a parade, a circus parade most of all. The circus was life, and it was a place of wonder. The history of the real circus gave us tremendous information and unexpected knowledge about Calder Circus. We learned that Calder's ringmaster is actually Fred Brodna. Calder's little tightrope dancer is Concolino. Concolino! His lion tamer is Clyde Betty. Calder's little bareback rider is Mayworth, the most famous bareback rider of the time. 
Her attributes were the giant pink bow, her little pink dress, and we can see all of those attributes in Calder's little character. It is very important for us to understand that Calder's characters are based on real life circus celebrities. It shows us his theory and understanding about his circus was that it depicts real life. There are two films that best depict Calder performing his circus. One is by Jean Pallavé and the other by Carlos Villarrebo. These are the primary sources we use to understand Calder's circus as a performance. Out of the possibly 200 performances, every single performance was unique. The films only show a fraction of the movements in the many performances of Calder Circus. During our research, we discovered photographs that showed the two acrobats performing movements that had never been filmed. This made us realize that the figures were capable of movements that we have never seen. In order to explore the possible additional movements, we created a replica of Calder's acrobats. We then worked with real-life acrobats to understand how the movement of Calder's characters related to movement in the real circus. The strength act, the hand-to-hand -hand act, is a classic standard act of the circus. There are two, generally, men involved in this act. It's a base and a flyer. The base supports the flyer who does handstands upon the solid strength of the base. Calder takes the direct moves from classic acts, but then does put his own interpretation on the moves. Calder's moves are not always physically possible in the realm of the circus, only in his circus. Calder identified and actually was each of the characters. He was every element. In a Calder circus, I don't think the artist's hand could be more apparent. He made everything, he changed things, he manipulated them himself. So some of the damage or some of the aging came as a result of that use. The damage caused by the constant movement is part of the history of the work. One could say that that's something one wants to preserve. There were a number of items which we thought were just badly repaired. Later on, it turned out that those so-called bad repairs are actually Calder's repairs. He was in the habit of repairing his own characters right during the performance. The black stitches here are quite clear. Calder probably did not have the white thread with him when this broke during the performance, so he just took the black one because that was the only one he had. So instead of fixing these old repairs, we leave them as they are because they are evidence of Calder's use and Calder's idea of his own circus. Calder commented on the importance of bright and brilliant colors. On close examination, we discovered significant fading. Often you can determine that by seeing folds in the fabric that have been protected from light or air. This shirt is also torn. The question is, can we replace the shirt to represent more how it originally looked. Well, we cannot really do it. And the reason is because Calder constructed this little figure by sewing together the little belt, the string, as well as the scarf. To replace the shirt, we would have to undo all of these original stitches, which we would completely lose. The times when we really intervened were the times when something was clearly broken and the films or photographs provided proof how they looked before. One tumbler was about to lose his head. It was hanging all the way to the back. We just saved the piece, specifically the head, the very last minute 
before they would have lost it. Naturally, when you are restoring a work of art that once moved, the temptation to think about getting it to move again is great. Colder surface cannot be performed for two reasons. One, for conservation, and two, because the great performer is not with us. Theater is very different than performance art. Theater has a script, it has instructions, and an assumption that other people will play it over time. Performance art is so closely related to the artist-creator that, in the case of Calder, like many others, it cannot be performed without the artist. Our research in this project is not an end in itself, but actually a beginning of a way to think about preserving a work of art of this nature. The Whitney's become the holder of the Calder's history and its future. We are determining how it is seen, how it is preserved, how it is presented over time, and that has very much to do with how the viewer interprets it. Our work will help the public to understand much better what the circus really was. In the end, our hope is that one realizes that although the Calder Circus is physically still, it remains alive in our imaginations.